existence of yoga, we do come across these forces coming up to you. Anyone who has done yoga seriously will find that he meets pishachas, he meets rakshasas, he meets asuras on the way. And all of them try to keep the individual down to the realms of these three beings, pishachas, rakshasas, asuras. Asuras are more powerful than rakshasas because asuras have not only great vital force, but they are also mental force. When the mind and vital both combine together and both of them come to oppose the higher forces, they become formidable. They can keep the nations and the civilizations under their spell because they have got such tremendous intellectual power to convince you and to give you false ideas and false glimmers. And each seeker is obliged to consider any proposition, anybody giving. Why not this right? Why not that right? And years and years can be spent in that kind of a search. You knock wrong doors. You are captured one way, captured another way. And the yogic process becomes completely ruined. It is psychologically therefore when Vishwamitra went to Dashrat to get the help of Ram and Lakshman to fight the Pishachas and Rakshasas and Asuras who were obstructing the yogi, the Havans, the Yajjas. It is actually a kind of a help which was sought by such a great Rishi like Vishwamitra so that these Rishis who were working and they were being besieged not necessarily in the rituals of sacrifices, but in their yogic practices. And all kinds of rakshasas were invading them. And to destroy them, the help of Ram and Lakshman was sought. In any case, any yogic process, anybody who does yoga, does come across these problems. In fact, you might say that at a certain stage of yoga, the opposite forces which are in us become more prominent than in ordinary human beings. That is because there is a battle which becomes a raging battle in the yogic process. It is this big yogic process by which you can purify yourself, you can conquer these forces. The Veda gives a good deal of description of them. But this is the second stage. Then comes a higher stage of yogic process. At the higher level of the yogic process, you have to ascend to what is called beyond illumined mind to the super mind. Now this entry into the supermind and the ascent to supermind is described quite widely in the Veda. And there are four important gods who are described in the Veda at this stage of yogic sadhana. The Veda calls them four kings. Varuna, Mitra, Aryaman, and Bhaga. These are the four kings, that is to say, they are the guardians of the supermind. And Veda describes each one of these four and tells you what is the nature of each one of these four psychologically. And what kind of sadhana is to be done in order to satisfy the demands of these four kings before you can be allowed to enter into the real realm of supermind. 
if you read the descriptions of these four, Varuna, you will find that Varuna is a guardian of vastness. Whenever you want to break the narrow limits of your consciousness, you worship Varuna and Varuna widens the consciousness. In this wideness, Varuna is also found to be the keeper of the law, the keeper of Rita. He is the one who is capable of Ritam. Brihat and Ritam, they both go together. So this vastness is the one in which the law of vastness is described. Wherever there is narrowness, the vastness breaks it. In fact, it is said that Varuna is the punisher who gives punishment. But this is a very vulgar way of describing. Varuna is simply the one who widens you. And therefore, wherever there is narrowness, his law of wideness operates and breaks your narrowness. Rita is nothing but the law of wideness. How to arrive at wideness and how to organize the wideness? Because in wideness there are many, many elements. And when you want to put all the different elements into some kind of an order, there is a law. There is a law of wideness. Law by which all narrowness can be broken. Therefore, Varuna is not a punisher of sin. It is simply that what is called sin is nothing but a result of narrowness. All limitation produces a wrong action. So whenever there is a wrong action and there is a constant operation of Rita, whether you like it or not, that law is operating all the time. So it immediately enters into the field of narrowness and breaks it. If you consciously know it and consciously pursue it, that is all yoga means. Yoga is a psychological process pursued consciously so that you go from level to level and master different planes of consciousness. Then, when Varuna is sufficiently established in our consciousness, we become as wide as possible, as synthetic as possible, then comes the law of Mitra. Or at the same time, simultaneously, because these four kings are operating almost simultaneously. One may do one predominantly now, another afterwards predominantly another, and so on. But these four kings have to be ultimately to be harmonized. Then comes Mitra. Usually you will find in the Veda, Varuna Mitra, that is to say together, Varuna and Mitra together. Because both of them, the wideness and the law, and harmony go together. So, Mitra is the lord of harmony. So, psychologically, it is the development of consciousness of harmony that is a precondition before you can read the supermind. You should be a great disciple of harmony, a great peacemaker, great lover, and one who understands and sympathizes becomes as vast as possible, universal consciousness, universal love. This is the element which has to be developed. At the same time, you cannot develop this unless you develop the powers of Aryaman. What is Aryaman? Aryaman is the lord of tapasya great austerity. 
it is the intensity which results in repeated effort. This repeated effort is the essence of tapasya. Usually human beings make an effort. After some time it is given up. And then one forgets about it. And if one lives a life of that kind, one may have some result, but it is not yoga. Yoga means repeated effort. Even in spite of all failures, you go further effort and further effort. Unless all the obstructions, unless all the gravitational pulls are conquered by repeated effort, it may take years and years and years and years. But one who is not fatigued, and this cosmic power which gives you the sustenance of constant effort is Aryaman. And then comes the fourth king, which is called Bhaga. Now Bhaga is the cosmic power of joy. It's quite different from Aryaman, where there is a lot of effort, a lot of tapasya. In Bhaga, there is the power of joy. Now, according to the Vedic psychology, if you want to read the supermind, which leads you ultimately to Ananda, the sweetness, the madhu, it is not easy to reach the real madhu, real honey, unless you practice the ability of enjoyment. Now this is a very important element in the Vedic Yoga. It's something different from many other yogas where this element is not present. But the Vedic Yoga maintains that our consciousness should be able to bear the joy. As you rise higher, there are many kinds of joys that come in your life. In fact, joy is at many levels, physical joy, vital joy, mental joy, illumined joy, and still higher joys. With every achievement, there is a joy. Joy is an automatic result of any expansion of consciousness. Now, often, when you have joy, you cannot bear it. In fact, the whole yoga which is connected with Soma in the Veda, is connected with this aspect of joy. What is Soma in the Veda? Soma is the cosmic power of delight. And this cosmic power of delight, even at lower levels, is experienced through Ashwins. Ashwins are the twin gods described in the Veda who are riders of the horse who in their chariots they carry the packets of honey and wherever they come they distribute that honey so that health is restored. That's why Ashwins are also called physicians of gods and uh, they cure by the power of joy, by the power of honey, harmony.